All right, we'll just start the meeting off to give keep people are be copping in here a little bit. The biggest question I've been getting all week is they talk about the new compensation plan that's being rolled out. Who's got questions? How can I answer them? Can you just do a like quick rundown of it? Because I mean, I kind of understand, but I'm not sure I understand. So. Okay. The new compensation rollout for January 2021 is going to be a $10,000 cap. Okay. 80-20 splits, 125 transaction fee, plus e and and royalty. Is so there is there something that in writing that reminds us of that? I I don't know where that comes from. AWSA CARES should have had the third phase put on there. Okay. Let's the I, I have a question. Yes, Ms. Hope. Okay, so my anniversary date is at the end of December. So do I have to wait a full year to the following December before I take advantage of the 10,000? How does it work? So if your anniversary is this coming December, you would enroll in the new one because January is where it'd be, be changed. Okay. Yeah, that's one thing I would challenge them on is getting that in because if it's end, end of December, it makes no sense enrolling an entire year for an right. anniversary like that. That's stupid. What should so you in, take, advantage, in, go ahead. take advantage of the plan now is recruit an agent underneath you in your downline that's got $2 million in production in the last 12 months, they will they will retro you back the $10,000 program now. I understand. Okay, so in other words, in January, I could take advantage of it. I don't want to have to wait up until 2022. Right, yeah. Okay. That, that's There's my so far. I'll make sure when that time comes, we have that conversation. Okay, so the only thing, and this is, well, I could talk to you offline. It's just an observation. So in other words, we're recruiting people and they could take advantage of that, um, the new commission split, right? In yeah. ours. Yes. Yeah, new, new recruits would take, would it would start a new, the new plan as they come in. That's why they're saying if you guys recruit into your downline, they would give you that opportunity to go retro too. Okay. Okay. Now, so for Jason and I, we have two different start dates. Well, you guys are on one cap, so I'm not really sure how they're going to do two different start dates. That's a great question. I'll find the answer for you. Okay. What's your start date? What's his? Mine was February. <laughs> and right. I, think, I think he said his is September. Okay. I mean, probably February would still count for it because it's going to be after the new year to go retro into. Okay. Well, just, like I said, let's get you a, a recruit into your downline now. Two million in production last 12 months, which isn't much. Right. Okay. And then, and that, so is it different for us at all, or it's just the start date's going to be different for us? I thought there was something slightly different for us. For team members? Yeah. It's just one, one okay. structure for, for a husband and wife teams. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so same structure then. The only difference is PC goes to a 70-30. Are we PC? As of now, you won't be next year. You won't be soon, actually. What defines us as PC? Two million in production or two years in the program. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's that's something I put in place to get people out of PC. I okay. love you guys being here, and it's, it's, it's a pleasure to serve you. It gets you into that higher bracketing. Okay. PC is 80, 20 or 70, 30. The difference being it's just, you just cap out faster. The goal in PC is to get you capped, to get you into hundred percent commission faster. So once we cap, just to piggyback, once you cap, you start that 80, 20, once you cap, correct? Within this year. Well, yeah, cause you would cap this year and then next year would be a different cap. The biggest thing is if you're able to get yourself a recruit, you would change 
what your cap amount would be for this year too. Mm, give me an example, please. Currently your cap is 15K. You get a recruit that's done $2 million in production in the last 12 months, your cap is now 10K. 10 what? 10,000, it goes okay. down. Got it. So we're doing that and then the 125 transaction fee caps at 40 transactions. So if you guys, when you got, when you become that level agent, you don't pay any more transaction fee also. So I don't understand because I don't know what the difference is between, because it totals all 18 grand. So I don't understand. I, I understand it gives you more money, but it's going to take you longer to cap. Essentially. For, for agents that are going to cap anyways, it's not going to affect much. For the middle belly of our, our business, the ones that are the one to three million that cap sometimes but not all the time, it puts more money in their pocket in the long run while we're able to still invest in all of the, the training technology coachings that we have, utilizing them. This doesn't like the rainmakers, the, the mega agents in our company that cap in two months or a month doesn't affect them at all. And that's what we're working on. We're doing this for the newer agents like you guys up through that, that 6 million in production, which will save you money in the long run. More money in your pocket now and the ability to cap out faster. We're also using it as a recruitment aid to help bring in some more agents into, the, into our market centers. Because that's what we're missing a lot of is we, we've got great coaching programs and assistance for you guys in, in the beginning through middle stage. But after you guys outgrow or to like a capping level, a lot of agents get out of PC and then go flounder for a while. That's the agents we're losing because we, they don't have the accountability. They don't have the stability of a PC agent or a team agent. And then some of them grow into a mega agent and team owners, rainmakers, and others get out of the business. If you look at our, if you look at our MLS, there's 40% of our MLS does between five and 10 deals a year. 60% does less than that. Well, I'd say probably 45, 50%, and then a small majority does much more. We're trying to cater to that. The oh. company calls it the fat middle, where the bulk of all the transactions are done. The ones, twos, threes, here's and there's. Your competition isn't me and Danny Roth and, and Polston, these companies that are doing 100, 200, 300 transactions a year. Your competition is Betty Sue and Missy Lee over at the brokerage doing one or two transactions a year or two and three because their friends just happen to trip into a deal. Stop it. We're trying to get you to a point where you guys can keep more money. Go ahead, Laura. So our split right now is supposed to be 70, 30. Right now? Yeah. It's no, 60, 60, 40. Yeah, 60-40. Okay. And where does the 70-30 come into play? That's the 2021 PC rollout. Okay. Every other agent is going to be 80-20, PC 70-30, instead of the 60-40. We're pushing everything back 10. Okay. So once we get kicked out of this, then we'll be 80-20? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, Big Ten. I heard that uh, I think if we close a deal before the end of June, will be uh, it's fifteen eighty five for you. It's it's a ten. It's what it is. It's a ten percent rebate back to you on your closed deals by the end of June. I didn't understand very well. It's a bonus check. Ten percent. Mm -hmm rebate back to you any closed deal between now and june you end up getting 75 percent total so oh, okay. it would be 75. it would be backing out backing out of your pc line the 10 percent 
So okay. yeah, royalty plus we're going to give you 10% as a cash back to help. It's helped a lot of agents. I mean, a couple hundred bucks back to you guys is what we're trying to do is it's kind of a stimulus so you don't have the cash going to the, the market center. And I can tell you that we've been running red lines on everything just to make sure the agents have money back. And all of the staff have taken, like I took a, 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 a salary freeze to keep money back into the pot. Okay. I'm just, pl I'm just proud that you guys stayed in production. Shit, a lot of you have done deals that hadn't touched and got into production and started making some money that wasn't there without the COVID. So I talk to other agents and other brokerages all the time and I'm not getting the same level of competency that you guys are putting out there. So clearly it's working. And now we're just trying to roll on to that into the coming next year, making it more advantageous for you. But you're absolutely right, Amber. The math still adds up the same in the upper end of it. My goal is to get you all way past that. My goal is to right. get you making 150 plus a year. That's, that's actually my ceiling as a PC coach. Once I've got an agent generating 150 plus, I hand them over to a maps coach. But that's why I asked that question because I'm like, well, it's all the same money. Like I, I, I see it stretch out through a longer period of time and I, and I get more money, you know, um, up front versus, you know, wait, waiting for time. Right. right. Um, I guess my question goes along with, um, I always mess up your name, pasture, right? Sure. Um, yes. If, right now I am, I'll, I'm two transactions away which my two listings, once I get those sold, I will cap. I don't want that 10%. Like I want to cap because that's not going to be beneficial for me. Yeah. Just, just send me. an email to the market center to, to Tiffany and Cindy. Mm -hmm. and just tell her, reply that to your cap. Oh. Okay. Yeah. How many volume, uh, my question, how many uh, sales volume do we need to make to be able to cap? Right now it's right around 2 million. Two million. Yeah, that's why it's kind of the magic number when I'm saying two million and a recruit two million in production for PC program, because that's that's the capping level is about two million dollars in production. Mm -hmm. At at ten million or sorry, at ten thousand dollar cap, it's one point six. Cap out, and then you're just transactional. And if you don't cap. You always stay in the coaching program or the coaching program lasts like a year. Yeah. I've capped the coaching program at two years because there are some agents that have just, you guys have never met them because they're not engaged and they're just, they're technically in the coaching program. They didn't have a default reset, which meant as long as they weren't hitting their production, they didn't, they never capped. So they just stay in the coaching program. I put a two year moratorium on it because it's two years, it's 2 million in total production or two years. So based on where I'm at in the system, and that's why I think we're actually looking at Laura and Jason, their numbers should be real damn close to that combined. And I know Hope's close, Laura and Jason are close, Mike's close. My goal is to get you guys all out of capping and keep you in production. If you want to opt back into the program and stay and do the trainings and coachings and, and grow your businesses beyond where you're at, that's awesome. You know, Big Dan, I have to say, though, we've been with Keller Williams for, you're going on almost three years, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you've really been the only coach that really, like, hounded us <laughs> to really be a part of this and actually consistently reached out, haven't quit yet, but... So I appreciate that. Yeah. Because I hope you're videotaping. What was that, Hope? I hope you're videotaping this. This is good stuff. <laughs> it is recorded. I don't know if it's ever going to be re reviewed, but I, I appreciate that. I saw a, a big hole in the coaching program when they asked me to take over, and I actually technically took over as the coach in November, October time of last year and didn't start getting paid until February because I was rebuilding it all and looking at everything. And like, that's how, that's how I found there was 22 people in the coaching program and eight of them had active phone numbers. I didn't even know there was a coaching program. Yeah. And that's the, that's where <laughs> we're missing out is you guys, you, and I, 
I, I hate to say it so bluntly, you guys were failed. You didn't have the support. You didn't have the, the leadership. You didn't have the coaching there to drive you, to push you, to grow your business. Hope's an opt-in. Charity's an opt-in. We got a couple other opt-ins you guys don't see all the time because they're, they're just one-on-one -on -one stuff that you don't see in the groups a lot. And their businesses are growing because of it. I've seen Hope's transition in the last, because she's, she's been around since before I was officially in position. So she got the, she's gotten the golden, the golden strides of being there from the, the creation of everything. And I appreciate her and everything she does. So. Hey, yeah, I feel the same. We're all, I, I believe everybody here knows how fortunate we are. And um, what I hear out of this, I mean, all we can do is go from here on, you know? So what I hear you saying, Dan, is our best bet is to re help recruit others and know that we're going to get some return on investment in January. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not going to affect you a whole lot monetarily right now just because nothing's going to change. And, and I'm pushing for that change to be more immediate. They're doing 2021 for the KWR accounting because it doesn't make sense to do everything mid-year. It, it's still going to be a, a hell of a mess come January 1st because not everyone resets in one month. January just happens to be the largest reset month. Mm -hmm. Second to that is December. <laughs> and then June. <laughs> so we're coming up on some, some stuff. June, July, the summer months are going to be interesting. And there's a ton of questions coming from every area. I'm just trying to pump back in more value to you guys. That's why I, I reinvest everything I get back into the business that I can. My real estate's what supports me doing my own deals. This program makes sense for me when there's 100, 100 to 200 agents in it. Then it starts making sense. Right now we're sitting at 44 and that's between both market centers. And I can tell you that the, the nine to 10 people that I see on a consistent basis on these calls are the nine to 10 agents that are actually making money in, build, in the real estate business. Sorry, I haven't gotten there yet, but I will. Yeah, you will. I think it's kind of a funny correlation that when you show up, you start making more money. I don't know why that works that way. I mean, I, I, I've heard that if you drive by the gym enough times, <laughs> I wish it worked that way. <laughs> I really, I really, I've, I've been told that when you show up and do something, it actually works out. So quit chewing on that. But I think, you know, that speaks to the E to P, you know, you, you can only go so far on your own, but once you hit that coaching is when you're going to actually go further. And I just appreciate that. I know I have actually one person to talk to because for a long time, I didn't know who to call. Me and either. that was really hard to just, it made me feel like, I was alone and it, and it just didn't, I mean, we didn't feel supported. So. And Amber's and so, right. You do, you do have the broker. Yeah. I, I can assure you I'm easier to reach than they are. Yes. <laughs> yes. And the, and that's and the that's really is, the bottom line. If I don't know the answer and I call the broker, they will answer my call before yours. Right. Because I'm supporting 44 of you through one channel. And I have seen a lot of things. I've done a lot of deals. But I, I, I do understand that the levity that comes into, you know, having that one source, the one person, the one voice, it's so much better than, okay, who am I reporting to? What am I doing? What's going on? Who's my support? What the fuck? Like it's, that's how I started in, the, in this business. It's kind of, and when I started, it was it, there, the, the, largest independent in Tucson. I can't say a name. It rhymes with Tierra Antigua. They, uh, when I started there in 2010, they gave me a CD of the documents I needed, showed me where the computers were that I could use and said, if you need to use a phone, that one works pretty well. It took me six days to write my first purchase contract. <laughs> and that was me trying to get help from, from the market center. So I don't, I, I hate that. And when I came to Keller Williams, I, I took my business from E to P and that was, I came in as a highly successful salesperson making $170,000 a year, doing all right, doing all right in sales, not knowing what I was doing. And then sitting down with, at the time was Billy Neal, who him and I are still good friends and I struck up a chord with, and he personally did the same thing I'm doing with you guys. Asked me very pointed questions 
held me accountable to the things that I said I was going to do and forced me out of my comfort zone and my business tripled. And that's after a long swell of just kind of figuring it out as I went. So I can only imagine what would happen to me 10 years ago if I had, I had this opportunity. So I do appreciate you guys saying that. What I love is that y'all show up. Well, I noticed that on, even on the bold pivot feeds that, you know, there's some, some people that are talking about how this is nothing new. They've heard all of the stuff before and blah, blah, blah. But I can tell you, I've heard it all before too. I, I was trained in most of the stuff that they're teaching and I've gone through it over and over, but I can tell you from being in the classes and even though I've heard it all before, there's something about the energy of having a bunch of other people with their ideas, reiterating stuff that yes, I know, but I had sort of like poo pooed it because my life wasn't showing anything. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So for me, it's just been a, oh yeah, I remember that. Oh yeah. Oh gosh. I need to get back to that, you know, kind of thing. Anyone else got a similar, similar feeling? Um, I can, I feel like I'm reliving ignite and, you know, I understand what bold is about, at least I think I do. And however, you know, I know we focus a lot on what's in these and these, but at the same time, we all can read. Like I get what Gary Keller has said and over and over, you know, but I myself want to, I want to know what you did. I don't care about what Gary Kelly did. Granted, I'm happy for Gary Keller. Otherwise I wouldn't be here right now with Keller Williams. Yeah. But my point is, I want to know what you are doing that made a difference in your business, not what Gary Keller said. I don't give a, I mean, I care, but I don't care because I can read it myself. Yeah. Right. But that's yeah. my little two cents. But overall, I'm an in-class person, so I, I'm ready to get back into the classroom because I think when I know this is good, you know, it's it still brings us together, right? But when we're in there, there's no distractions. Right. And that's where we're going to stick this. I don't think the Thursday Zoom is going to go away. This, this brings too much blood, like opportunity for people that are not typically. Yeah. There. It lets us be real. Right. I am going to be in offices. I'll be in Sierra Vista twice a month. I'll be at the east side once a week. So that's I'm trying to figure out the best days to do that so that we have those in-person opportunities. We have the the collaboration efforts again. I completely understand Amber when you're saying that you want to know what is going on in the moment, in these deals, in these situations. That's why I'm here. I understand the MREA, the one thing shift, all these coaching models and systems. My job is to be able to take those models and systems and apply it to your situation. Just like the other, we had that phone call. You're like, I don't understand about this cutting of expenses. It seems like it's much higher than that. We broke it down. I was able to say it's it's granular, and then it, you had a click. You're like, oh, oh, that makes sense. That's the difference between being somebody who just has the book in their hand to having a coach ex getting that and walking them through it. I don't know any any of you played sports, right? You you could have read you could have read what to do. Like, right? all right, Dan tackle the other color if it has the ball. Okay, I got this. Your coach was there to help put you in the right place, show you the form that was changing. Get out of the couch, dude. My dog's chewing on the couch. <laughs> um, the distractions are real, you're right. But that's the thing is it's, it's taking what is written and the, the, just the basic bones of it and applying it to situations. Now, the great thing is, is I have a lot of insight when it comes to outside real estate and just people and sales in general, so I can help you develop mindset and skill, but I'm always going to coach to the models and systems of Keller Williams because it's a, it's a much larger proven data set than my experience. My, my millions in sales is, you know, 
infantile when you compare it to the billions that have been underdone in this company. And these books are educated and researched through interviews with top producing agents that have a long track record of success. That's one of the things Gary prides himself on in his company is that no one in this company teaches without having a prior track record of success. You've always heard that I've heard the term outside of this business that those who do do those who can't teach. And that's like when I started listening to people that were up in front of the rooms, spelling their stories. And I had that mindset like, Oh, why aren't you out there making these millions of dollars in sales? What you don't know is behind the scenes, their teams are doing this. They're taking their time and donating it to you guys to grow the agent base because they know that the more, highly capable, extremely competent, professional agents out in the marketplace that wear the red badge makes them look better in the long run. So. My dog is being sweet and biting my hand. So right. it's, it, may I speak to Amber? I think she's a, Amber, you're the one that just chimed in, right? About, uh, wanting classroom experience i know it me as a, a learner i learn better and i think things through when there's no distractions i'm a classroom person i'm not an online person i understand i did bold last year in in real time in real life back when we could all meet together and it is different when it's a group of us there was a group of a hundred of us and i was a newer agent but I would like to encourage you because that catapulted me into action. Um, so it's very much on us as individuals. Um, there was something about writing down my goal. I said I wanted six transactions and I got them, but that was a first for me. Uh, so, and we couldn't say the word, but I, I couldn't help but notice you use the word, but, and we can't use the word try. And we all had to flip our bold bracelet whenever we did that. So there is something to being in real life, but considering the circumstances, I, I felt um, Keller Williams and of course, Big Dan has come alongside. Did we lose hope? We froze. We can't lose hope. We must carry we it. Hope. We can't lose hope. <laughs> yeah, after the word but is typically an excuse. And I, I use the word but very strategically because the word but nullifies or negates the statement before. Correct. Take, take the following statement. You're a great employee, but I'm going to need you to show up on time. It just completely nullifies the first point. Using the word but has to be a very strategic thing. And you, you don't want to say, I really like the, what's going on here and everything is great, but I'm just wait, what? Everything you just said just went to shit. I'm only listening to the next negative part. The word, but, however, meanwhile, these are all things that still take the same place as but. And it's extremely difficult to break the habit. And they say, well, use and. And. You're a great employee. And if you showed up on time, you would be a better one. You're a great salesperson. And if you followed what people told you to do, you'd be a better one. Right? It's, 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 a, it's a mindset thing. I use but very strategically. <laughs> and I still slip up all the time. And David corrects me. It's, it's training. That's why she's going with the butt thing. So the bold, bold in person, way different than bold pivot, bold pivot, a lot of fundamentals, not a whole lot of in person drilling it in. And that's why we're doing a lot of the, the coaching corner on Monday is to help drill that down to help identify. Okay. This was the concept we talked about who has some ideas. Let's talk about it. Let's, let's do a group session and like mastermind around the idea so that you're able to maybe pick up on something you didn't hear before. On Monday, I was actually motivated to look at my cell phone bill because somebody in the class had said, well, I negotiated my cell phone bill and I saved a bunch of money and blah, blah, blah. I, I'm sitting there in the middle of the, the coaching corner on my computer. 
I pull up on the other screen, I pull up Verizon and I, I look at my bill and I start reading it real quick. I hadn't done this and I've been paying $15 a month for the last however long I've had an iPhone for the added protection, the, the lost and theft protection. I have Apple Care Plus that I bought through Best Buy that I pay $4 a month. Exactly, Tessa's dog knows. So, and, and that was the thing, like, I was able to, like, it just, it piqued my interest, like, oh, that's, I, I didn't even think about looking at my phone bill. And so I went and reduced my phone plan, took off the Apple Care or the, the double care, like double insurance, and saved myself $35 a month. And that was just like, oh, yeah, I forgot to look there. So there's still, there's a lot of value in, in just the, the showing up in some of the masterminds when we get the opportunity to bold in person again, I hope that everyone can go through it. It's a much different environment, much different because I haven't taken bold officially. My boss is a bold coach. He is a coach of bold coaches. I think I get a little bit more than I'm supposed to without having to pay for it when he walks into my office every day and yells at me. So, but I'm, I'm very, I'm very appreciative of it because he's always constantly growing. Because I struggle uh, and I need to do better on finding an accountability partner for me. Um, because when you don't know how it benefits you, you don't know what you don't know, right? right. How many times have we heard that? So in the event of not having a, an, an accountability partner to hold myself to my numbers, um, I don't know what to do at, at that point, you know, when I don't have an accountability person to do that. Yeah, we need to find you an accountability partner. And then the biggest thing is if you had an accountability partner, you need to reach out to them. I happen to know that people on the call have accountability partners they haven't talked to. So what's the point in that? Raising your hand and saying, help me, help me, help me. And someone's like, yeah, I'm willing to help you. And then you don't do anything with it. Like Jason and Laura, I really hope they're not each other's accountability partners. Oh, no. That doesn't work. Got to be outside. Sterling, who's your accountability partner? <laughs> well, I don't have one, but I, I have not done it because... I know at this point I can't be accountable. I, I You're just choosing. know I can't, huh? You're choosing to not be accountable. No, I can't. I just can't. I know I can't meet numbers. I'm, I'm, I'm setting some goals for myself, and I can't even keep those for myself. Why no. not? Huh? Why not? I've just got too many irons in the fire right now. Okay. It's time. It's time to flush your life for the priorities. I I'm trying. Believe me, if I there's there's two things. I have two one things <laughs> okay. that if I can get them off of my plate within the next thirty days, I will be so free. But they're not things that I can hand off to anybody else. I, I'm the executor of my parents' estate, and it takes deadlines and court hearings and document files and i'm having to travel back and forth between sierra vista and tucson in order to get some of that done and and sometimes it just pops up when i don't expect it so it's it's things like that that i just can't i hate i hate to be the one to say i can't but this is something i can't do until i get that off my plate well then you know sometimes you do have an immovable object what happens when we have an immovable object? Call a rock blaster? I don't Go around it? <laughs> no, it's my answer, Amber. Go around it. <laughs> you, you can tell who's in the military, Jess. Look at you. So blow it up. <laughs> Hoorah.
I was in the engineering. What can I say? <laughs> I can tell. That's what we did. <laughs> we just... Join the military. Meet exciting. Go to exciting places. Meet new friends. Kill them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. We, we, we go around it. We find a way around. We find an alternate path straight through over and up right through it blasting through it isn't always the best thing that is the fastest and shortest way to do it yes does that always mean that's the way we need to take it life is not linear don't think of it as such every day we make decisions those decisions come with actions those actions have consequences positive and negative the word consequences is actually a, a, a neutral term that we've made negative what positive constant quick cons uh, i can't speak what positive things the positive consequences can come from your actions change again change change so if you, have, if you have something in your life that you have to work on that's right in front of you, you can't get around it you gotta get through it then you don't have another way around you must take action to get through it. So do that. Get it on. Get it on. That's your number one thing. Get it out of your way. There's a bold law that I really like. You can have results or reasons. Or yeah, you can have re reasons or results. You can't have both. And your job is to get rid of every possible reason. So you can have results. I'm on a call. These kids, I tell you, speaking that German. <clears throat> yeah. So I, I completely understand, Tess, and I'm, I'm proud to see how much you've been able to jump in and join in and do things. Just stay the course. Yep. Stay the course you're on. Keep working it inch by inch. You'll get there. I love Michael Winings in his, in his office. He's got a board. It's got 1% greater every day. 1% greater every day. Doesn't seem like much. At the end of a year, you're 36 times better than you were without moving 1%. If you made five phone calls yesterday and that was your success, do 1% more the next day. Yeah. Doesn't amount to much. And as time moves on, it extrapolates and it grows at an exponential rate, then you're making 150 phone calls in a day. That's your new norm. That number scares people because they're like, oh no, 150. Oh my God. There are teams in this company that mandate they make at least 200 calls a day. That's four hours of solid dialing. I have a question. People are making lots of money. Yeah, Miss Amber. Um, I'm having an open house this weekend. Um, your advice, I want to have it with somebody else because have being um, doing a, what is it, control of who comes in, who goes out type thing with the whole COVID. Um, do, would you recommend, I know adding an agent would be more people, right? But I was thinking having uh, myself and another agent, any of you guys want to do an open house with me this weekend, um, be, you know, take a buyer in while the other agent outside says wait until they're done and then take whoever that other agent is then goes in the house while the other <laughs> got done showing go outside and wait for the next person in the event that we have that much you know traffic thoughts i like it i like splitting them up whoever's got the most rapport with people move into it i like doing open houses in pairs personally when you're there, you're able to role play. You're able to discuss. You're able to bullshit and have some shenanigans and talk and, and socialize and create an environment that's not so mundane as sitting in a house for four hours. Remember, remember the thing we talked about a couple of weeks ago, sitting in a box, talking to people, hoping they get the right information. When you have somebody else there, it boosts your confidence. Where's your open house going to be? It's going to be at 9322, um, my listing that I have right now. Uh, it's going to be one to four. So if anybody yeah. wants to join me, let me know. Out of town. Oh, I'm sorry, Tucson. And I'm just, I'm just bugging. I know the other one can't have an open house because the lady's crazy. <laughs> Stop it. She's not crazy. I can catch which side of town. I still can catch which side of town. 
It's on the east it, side. It's east side. It's off the 29th um, between Harrison and Camino Seco. Any of y'all want to do a partner on an open house this weekend? I already no. said I would love to, and I'm over here on Rita Ranch, so I'm not that far away. There you go. I'm in Vail, off of Marion Cleveland, Tess. The yeah. price of your team. Let's do it. Two Air Force, right? Oh, I don't know. Air? That's a lot. To, that's a lot to handle. <laughs> So maybe you guys will push each other outside your limits. I like it. Great stuff. I like it. So when you're doing when you're doing open house with a partner, have a you know, have a moment in there. Just do some scripting, some role play in the morning, or right before you get there, working to get before you're officially open, and do some some warm ups of introducing. Hi, welcome to the open house. My name is. You are. Please sign in. I'd gladly show you around. Blah blah blah. I'm I'm excited to be able to do some open house classes with you guys. It is one of my most favorite classes to teach. And it's not really a class, it's just how I do things. And I push people out of their comfort zones so much. I literally pushed Hope out of her chair. So Yes, yes, you did. Yes. <laughs> and then we had somebody duplicate that whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> they took notes, it worked. Greg yeah, and, I and Jasmine have been in a lot of my open house classes and it changed their business. Just because now that open houses are starting again, it's all in how you present yourself. And it's really going to benefit everyone. So we'll start doing that. And I'm going to give you guys a little pearl to it. What do you say when someone walks into your open house, Amber? I say, welcome home. There you go. <clears throat> welcome home. Say it with a smile. Say it like you mean it. Oh, yeah. And I love open houses. I, I feel like you could connect with somebody better versus over the phone. Uh, having that eye contact, I think, makes a difference. Energy transfer. That's why like you're able to mimic, you're able to mirror, you're able to get some nods, get some motivation in, in, in some movements together. You can't do that on the phone. You can do it through tonality and just having a voice and smiling. Like I can take my video right off and it changes the entire conversation. But you can tell that I'm smiling. You can hear my voice. You can also tell when I'm not. In person, you're able to mirror them better. So take as much opportunity to do that as possible. If you have a phone call, try to switch it to a Zoom call. So I have a question, Big Dan. Yes, ma'am. Um, we sort of brought this up before, I think. Um, and I know we're looking at trying to get back to people to people, but is there a way to do some listing presentation, role playing kinds of things where whether you're doing it with an actual client and I noticed on zoom, you can actually be part of a zoom conversation, but not be shown as being there. The host has to do it. A ghost presentation. Like, yeah, like you're talking to a client, but you have somebody else that's observing that presentation. That's not something that I've played with, but I'll see if I can find out. Um, but even if it's not between somebody and a, and a real client, it would be wonderful if I could just watch somebody go through, act out what they would do, you know? I'd, I'd be glad to do. Why don't we do that on one of these classes? You want to do it on, on, I'm actually doing a listing presentation on Monday. So I'll be a little, little delayed. I'm trying to do it quickly before our call out in Green Valley. I'd be interested too, definitely. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do, we'll definitely do some, some role play on that. That's one thing I want to start putting into some of these, these masterminds is working with you guys directly on listings, buyer presentations, how to set the expectations. My biggest, my biggest hurdle right now working with any of the agents in our teams all across our entire company is the inspection period. Agents from all different companies, all different experience levels, are clearly not guiding their buyers correctly when it comes to inspections and asking for things that were clearly visible at the time of the first busy. So that's why you want to be, you know, a little bit more skilled when it comes to your inspections, how to set up the presentations for that and what we're looking for so that it makes your life easier in the negotiations 
and I'm, I'm going to showcase something. I'm not going to say names, but if a client is asking for a screw to be added to a hinge on a Benzer, it tells me we haven't done a good enough job of isolating what they desire. I had another one today of wanting a electric plate cover. So essentially the cover that goes on the outlet, the plastic attached better, like tightened. So Neither of those items are what I consider a major concern. And both of those items can be visible while you're walking the house the first time. I would like to know as a new agent, we always hear potty or potty. What's the pipes? Potty. Polybutylene. What is it? Polybutylene. Okay, polybutylene. Blech. Polybutylene. Tell me about that because age, uh, time period, because when we talk about that, you know, not all of it, it was bad, right? Only people that were doing, or was it all just bad? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what the big deal is. As a new agent, you hear things and you're like, I don't know. Yeah, so poly pipes is a, is a type of plastic pipe that was released in the late 80s, early 90s. So any houses from 85 to 95 have the potential of poly, polybutylene piping installed. It was usually the houses that had what they call the um, what I'm looking for, manifold, the water manifold in the front closet that were having issues. The manifolds were separating. The pipes were coming off the, their uh, fixtures. So the couplings, the, the termination points, the elbows, all these items, the poly pipes weren't able to grab onto and were separating and flooding out homes. Another big issue was the poly from the street to the house during freezes was erupting at the street level or right next to the house, create, creating massive flooding that the sellers were gonna have to pay for. The way to check that is you can usually pop off the box in a washer and dryer and then look underneath a little bit and see if they're bluish gray pipes. What do you mean, pop off the? You're talking about where the pipe, where the um, the water yeah. lines are. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Dan. I would say you could go through your whole life and not have any problems with polybutylene, but most people do want them changed out, and it's not too. It, I don't feel like it's too expensive that it would be a deal breaker, but it depends on the client. It's what typically prices? between six and nine thousand dollars to repipe a house through poly, and a lot of those don't include the drywall repair that's needed. The problem with polybutylene is if it is stated to have existing polybutylene, a lot of insurance companies will not insure that house. That's the big issue. Some houses have gone 20, 30 years without a problem. They're built in the 80s, they're as old as I am. Sorry to make you feel a little toast, I didn't mean that. And me too. These houses built in the 80s and 90s that haven't had an issue ever. And they've gone through some massive freezes and massive ch earth changes, not an issue. The problem is insurance companies are done paying out. They're like, no, 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 we've paid out 10 years of this BS, we're done. So scour your SBDSs, make sure you double check them for all of these items, all of these issues so that if the seller doesn't know what kind of piping's in the house, or if it says copper on the SPDS, you wanna verify it. And that's always a great thing. Home inspectors are gonna check for it. And usually they'll do is they'll pop off the trim piece on the washer and dryer, cut a little piece out of the drywall, and look down the wall to see if it's a grayish blue pipe. I would consider poly a major issue. Thanks, because, you know, like I said, as a new agent, we don't know anything about home. Well, at least I don't know anything about homes. I just know how to sell or, or you know, buy, not actually physically look at what the home has that could be major issues in the future. And as you guys are selling more and more homes or you're doing home inspections, you're going to learn a ton of knowledge. It's extremely applicable to your clients. And partner up with someone. It's got a, a house that's going like you're doing a walkthrough or you're doing an inspection and say, hey, you know, do you mind if I tag along? 
and go, go look at different neighborhoods, go do different inspections and stuff like that. The funny thing is, is I did, I, I sat at an inspection for one of my old team members on the house across the street from the bot. So I, that's why I was, I knew this neighborhood very, very well. I sold the house down the street, across the street, my team's it's the house I did an inspection on. So I learned the neighborhood intimately. I've sold seven houses in this neighborhood because I know it so well. And that's because I sat on some inspections and I, I know this type of build out of a house. So when I walk in with buyers, I can tell them, okay, hey, this is gonna be an issue. This is gonna be an issue. This is easy to fix. This is easy to fix. Don't worry about this, 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 and this. I actually had a conversation with Eileen today on one of her Benzers and I went through every line item. This is actually pretty easy to fix. This will cost you a couple hundred bucks. This could cost up to a thousand. The sellers can probably do this on their own. The sellers can definitely do this on their own. And just as you do the inspections, as you see more and more of these things, when you're working with your buyers and they're coming through a house and they're like, oh my God, it's destroyed. You're like, actually just need some paint. And you can speak with that confidence and then you're able to, to sell distressed properties easier and you're able to sell properties that may have some, some character that you need to work through. And by being, hey, listen, I know that you want that open concept. You guys have a little bit extra money in your budget and you were gonna do some work to the house anyways. Why don't you just think about taking a wall out? I've seen houses in this neighborhood, they do that. It looks amazing. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, you can do that? And when you speak with confidence on, on a solution to a problem, it doesn't come up and it doesn't become an issue in your negotiations. Now on your inspections and stuff like that, you can, you can talk educated and, and very, you know, formal about this is a major concern. I've seen it a couple of times. This is something that I would not worry about. This is definitely something your nephew can come over on a Tuesday with a hammer and a shovel and take care of it. Then you're not dealing with, you know, 10, 12, 15, 30, 50 items on a Benzer. You're dealing with, HVA system needs to be replaced, roof needs to be refixed and repaired, and termites need to be treated. Not the window shutter on the front left window needs to be reattached, the sink in the bathroom is leaking and the valve needs to be replaced. And like, these are all things that are normal home ownership, small, small potatoes. And as a seller's agent, if I get a Benzer back that's got a bunch of these small potatoes on it, I know the buyer was just looking for something. Yeah. And I'm going to call the agent and I'm going to say, Hey, listen, this is the situation. You guys saw the faucet when you came in, you saw the shutters when you came in, you saw that that front door, you know, was old and had been kicked in at one point when you came in. Here's what I'm willing to do. And then I school the agents on it. And when they're like, Oh, this is going to be really expensive. Actually, no, it's not. If you call this guy at this company and tell him that, this is what we're going to do. It's going to cost you $515. Oh, really? That's it? Okay, great. I got a seller out in Sarita right now that won't call me back and we're day two of his Benzer response. And I've got probably $4,000 worth of work on this bill and he doesn't want to spend a dollar. And it's stuff that I would consider that needs to get done. That reminds me of the old HGTV shows that family would walk in and everything that they complained about was just merely cosmetic. It didn't have anything to do with the structure, the layout. It, it was all, it was all fixable at little to no effort. Sweat equity. You guys have seen my house. Like a lot of you watch the videos, the before and afters. My house was 100% cosmetic. Ugly as shit had bear heads and wolf heads and all kinds of heads in the walls. <laughs> I saw right past it because I knew this neighborhood. Take this wall out, put some paint on it. It's going to look brand new. He was underpriced in a hot neighborhood and I was the only person to put an offering on it. When the time came, my, my inspector gave me a book of things to <laughs> change on this house. Stop. Change on the house. And as a consumer, I was like, you know what? I could definitely ask for all of these things because I was talking directly to the agent. I was like, and you know that that's going to happen. I'm going to ask for this, 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 and this only. 
and I'll take care of the rest. And the, the seller's agent was like, really? You're only going to ask for those things? It just happened to be $5,000 worth of stuff because I pointed out all the other ones as leverage and just said, hey, this, these are the major concerns. And then I put a safety aspect behind them. Yeah. And I learned that from, you know, one repetition, but two, it's talking to the, ins in the inspectors and they're going to know, Hey, this is an issue because of this, if this could happen. And then just ask them, how, how could that be remedied easily? If they're a good inspector, they're going to have, they're going to have a guy. Yeah. They're going to have an idea and they're going to have seen it before and be like, no, 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 this is where you're at. I did an inspection with uh, Michael. Hey, Michael Oakland. I can't remember his company name. He, 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 he really shined to me because he took me outside and pointed out how he knew what kind of site <laughs> in the house and what to look for. And he showed me the logo inside the design and he told me that this could be the issue. This is, this is what's going on with it. And this is how to avoid it. And I was, as a consumer, I was like, Oh my God, that's, that's great information. Now I have that knowledge. So the next time I have a client, I can show them the same things and wow them. All right. I'm rambling too much guys. You need to talk more. Regarding the Benzer, everybody try to get every time the broker has a call, especially if it's about a Benzer, I'd recommend getting on that. Um, and then trying to articulate if you want to repair or replace, don't give them two options. I don't know how you feel about that, Dan, but <laughs> got to dumb it down a little bit. Maybe give them three, the must have. The yeah. Stop it. I would stay away from repair or replace on Benzers. Well, in other words, say one or the other, which one you want, because if you have a choice, Tell they're gonna exactly what you want. Like the Benzer should be able to be picked up by a handyman and used as a work order. You pick it up, okay, the window on the south side of the garage needs the frame repaired. Cool. Faucet is identified in section 1.6 of the home inspection provided needs to be replaced. Handyman goes, okay, so this is the faucet, this is the home inspection, okay, cool, needs to be replaced. Not faucet needs to be repaired or replaced. Which one? The, the one on the left side of the house, the right side of the house, they're both leaking. Which one do you want replaced? So let's run a little bit long. Eileen, I think this is important. Eileen, you said you have a headache from your sellers and the buyers because nobody wants to do something. That's correct. Okay. What do you mean by you don't know how to be the source? Okay. So I don't know what to tell to my client anymore because they don't want to spend any money. And um, the buyer at the same time, they're like, we're only asking for them to clean up the, clean out the AC and change the exhaust button. And that's it. And I'm like, okay. And then I would go to my client and clients like, no, we're not spending any money. Just tell them if they don't want to buy the house, just don't something like that. So aren't you guys I, under contract on another house? No, they, uh, the, the, our, <laughs> our offer was turned down, so they don't have any house yet. That's probably why your sellers are being apprehensive is they don't have an exit plan. They are not motivated to sell the house because right now they don't have anywhere else to go. Right. So I, I don't know what to do anymore. <laughs> uh, the biggest thing right now for you is line out the cost of them. And show them like, cause some of the small things was like that electrical box, the, the vent fan in the bathroom, mm -hmm. depending on what kind it is, will take an hour and a $60 fan and a handyman to do it. So maybe 200 bucks. I did offer, I, I did give her that, you know, um, cost. And I even offered that maybe I can just pay for it because to clean the AC, it's probably like a hundred or something. And then buy the exhaust fund, it's probably 70 to 100 and then you know hire someone to put it but she's like no because my husband said no you're not going to spend money in anything in their house or something like that so i i don't know i'm trying so I'm, I'm, I'm the, the thing is they're they're okay letting the deal go something like that yeah, it's what it sounds like because they don't have another house. We need to get them, you know, re-anchor them to their desire to sell the house and buy something else and say, listen, if we, if, if, 
if you're going to let a $200 repair stop you from selling your house and getting you guys onto your dreams, I can't help you. But here's a line for you, Eileen. Mr. And Mrs. Seller, I completely understand you guys don't want to spend any more money on your house and that's okay. You don't have to. Is selling your house still important to you? Wait for a response. Now, if they say yes or no, then you know where to go with. No, we're good. Then you know that nothing you do is gonna get you anywhere. If they say, yeah, it's still important to sell you, then ask them, so out of curiosity, what is it about a couple hundred dollars of deferred maintenance that wasn't done beforehand is stopping you from getting this deal done? Okay. And if they're like, because a lot of things, it was the cash, right? We don't have the cash to do it. Right. And then tell them, well, if we don't have the cash to repair these items, why don't we offer the seller a small credit in lieu of repairs? Right. Because the things that they can take care of, the minor things that need to get done anyways, I think that's just a, a quick afternoon to fix, but the AC servicing and the fan in the bathroom, just tell them, look, if you're unwilling or unable, that's the key term, unwilling or unable to do these repairs, are you open to a small credit to the buyers at the close of escrow? Requires no money out of your pocket. Okay. Try it that way. But first ask them if it's important for them to sell the house still. Okay. So. Thank you. My pleasure. Here to help anywhere I can. Anything else guys before we shut down? I love it how Jason just sits in the back and gives commentary and he's just outside of the mic range. <laughs> That's how he rolls. I like it. It's that federal employee in him. <laughs> observe. Solid professional. Solid <laughs> professional. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining me this evening. If, if I can do anything, please give me a call or text. If you have any questions that pop up about the comp plan, any other questions about contracts, clients, anything at all, questions about life, I'm here to help any way I can. Big Dan, I have a suggestion. How about if we work on a contract next time? We meet like next, next, next time we're going to do role plays on a buyer or a, mm. a listing presentation. We can do a okay, contract. Maybe. Absolutely. We shall, yeah, because there's so many things on contracts which we need to know. Read the contract, guys. The contract will tell you all that you need to know, but we'll definitely do some stuff on the contract too because I think knowing the contract inside and out, backwards, forwards, and from the middle to the edges will help you negotiate, will help you deal with any kind of situations, and will help you keep yourself from getting sued, period. Don't let some lawyer take your money because he knew the contract better than you did. It's my parting advice. If you have not read the contract cover to cover, go do so tonight. If you're <laughs> unsure of the timelines, here's, here's a fun exercise. I did this myself. Take the contract, take a piece of note paper, and then put a zero where the contract starts, and then go find every timeline. Yeah. That's what I've been doing. Remember a few weeks back, I asked for the checklist and I couldn't find the yep. contract closed checklist and I finally found it. And I've been going through it and even inserting new lines in things because there's like, like an assumption between this step and this step that I, I wouldn't have known, yeah, but so reading the contract. Send yeah. me what you have so far. I'd like to audit you. See where okay. you're at. Send me a picture of it if you want, just a screenshot or something. Okay. Yeah. I'll take a screenshot of my um, vision board too. I'm, I've, I actually made progress on it. Yes. Vision I know. Progress. Little by little. I tell you, I'm making progress. It's just not as fast as everybody else. Ah, 1%. Great. That's all I'm asking for. 1%. Yeah. 1% okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great day, Big Dan. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.